is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Son of a Trickster, brought to you by Robin. In these chapters, where to start? I said that Jared's life was pretty depressing last episode, and little did I know how much worse it was going to get, because at least he had his mom, and it doesn't seem like he even has her anymore. Jared's got nobody, man. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. So, uh, some of you may remember way back when I started Spoil Me, um, Patricia, no, was it Patricia? Yes, it was. Patricia commissioned a um, Diana Wynne-Jones book called Fire and Hemlock. Diana Wynne-Jones is a pretty well-known author, but Fire and Hemlock is sort of a lesser known book of hers and it is it deals a lot with the issues of a child who is while not outright abandoned essentially abandoned left to her own devices and sort of treated as if she is a if not burden at the very least an inconvenience a lot of the time. And her mother basically hands her off to her grandma um, in so many words, because all she is interested is trying to get a relationship going with somebody who will take care of her. Now that is not exactly the situation here with Jared. His mother is, more complicated and the history is more complicated. It's not just, I want things to work with Richie. And so I'm going to completely throw you to the wayside. However, it's not, not that. Does that make sense? Like, I wouldn't say that Richie is like her motivation in this. Her motivation in anything is usually rage. His mother has clearly got a lot of rage in her that she has not dealt with and is not really interested in dealing with as far as I can see. And she isn't really able to, I don't even want to say control because that's too simple. She isn't even able to get out of her own head enough to look at a situation So she's over here. All right. I'm going to, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We start with chapter 18. um, And he is trying to get in touch with his mother and he can't, he's not getting any replies from her via text message. Um, His mom came back a few days later. He heard her voice upstairs. He heard her laugh. Where were you? Jared said. At the spa, she said, getting a fucking mani-pedi. Where do you think I was? Dead? Jesus, stop being a bitch. So it turns out that they were doing something really shady. She talks about plausible deniability. um, And the fact that he asks her to please not do anything that will get her killed is very touching to her because she has a very low threshold for being sweet, apparently. Um. He goes upstairs the next day and goes over to Mrs. Jack's place looking for Sarah. Sarah is not there, but Mrs. Jack, Ms. Jack's takes him over to this uh, protest, the idle no more protest, which I was really excited about. Um, We actually get very little of the protest itself. I thought that this was going to be like a big main event moment, maybe even something that in a TV show, um, we would call like a set piece, but it's not actually, it's a really like emotional thing in that him and Sarah seem to connect 
in this scene more than they have anywhere else. So in that sense, it's a big moment for him because they're holding hands and he's obviously like really starting to get into this girl in a real way. And he doesn't seem to know how to deal with that. Um, and I just really enjoy in some ways how it, how much this undercut my expectation. Um, because it finishes with, there were other people at the rec center. There were speeches, there were songs. Jared only remembered Sarah's face, excited and happy the tips of her fingers searching out his. So on the one hand, this is adorable because, you know, I just, I can't tell sometimes if I'm falling into the same trap that the characters are falling into where I'm like, do I like them together? Or do I just like the fact that he has somebody to like have his back at all now? Is that how low my, like my standard is? Um, and then I'm like, do I even like Sarah that much? Like, I think I do. She's super weird. And in some ways it feels very, what's the word I want? I hate to say manic pixie dream girl, because that's like that thing that has gotten so overused as to be almost meaningless at this point. But it does feel that way with the way that she like, she'll randomly put fake blood on her clothes just for something to wear. Like it's not, she's going anywhere in costume. She's just doing that. And the fact that she's like an activist or hyper aware of things and sort of opening his mind in some ways, I'm just kind of like, ah, this again. And then in other ways, I'm like, yeah, but I like her though. Uh, Robin says, I don't know more is a real ongoing protest movement in Canada, which I think is why it's mostly a background event here. There were, I don't know more events going on in many communities around the time the book was set. Okay. Thank you, Robin. And hi, hi. Um, okay. That's cool. Um, yeah. So he has this lovely day with her. He goes home. I'm going to soon read this guys. <laughs> When Jared got home, he found his door kicked in. His clothes were tossed around the room, and most of the furniture was broken. The mattress had been slashed. The wall that separated his space from the laundry room was full of punches. They'd taken apart the toilet tank. Jared shut off the water. It drained into the hole in the concrete, but his clothes were crumpled and muddy. He sorted out the clothes that were salvageable and wrung them out in the utility sink. His cell phone buzzed. You might want to stay with Blake for a few days, Richie texted him. Your mom's pissed. So let's talk about how much things have turned around that Richie is now going to be the one that's sort of warning Jared and like letting him know how angry his mom is because it has been her warning him about Richie most of the time. Let's also talk about the utter shock that I felt in realizing his mother did this. There, it's really interesting to me. Once, once I start paying attention, how little this author is interested in telling us how Jared is feeling a lot of the time. We get very matter of fact descriptions of things. And we get physical description of feeling nauseous or cold or whatever. But in terms of his emotional reaction to stuff, it's left very, like anybody else writes this scene and you would have phrases like his stomach sank or he stood there in shock staring or anything like that, that sort of gives us a really fast, quick, he's shocked. He's upset. He's what we don't get that in this scene at all. It is a completely by the, by action description. This is what the room looked like. And this is what he did. He turned off the water. He wrung out his clothes there is no reaction described. And that is interesting to me. I am both 
a fan of this method because it leaves a lot of open room for us to decide how we feel about it instead of worrying about how he feels about it. And also there's the show don't tell and we get like, this is really whether he's upset or not. However, he may be feeling in this moment. He deals with this in a very practical manner. And that seems to be what the author wants us to pay attention to. He doesn't sit there bawling about it. He's not like stunned into inaction. He sees this mess and he decides that he's going to start cleaning it up. And that's what he does. He went upstairs and found his mom covered in drywall dust, her knuckles bleeding. She stood in front of the fridge, holding the door open. Richie was nowhere in sight. Hi, Jared said. She kept looking in the fridge, then grabbed a beer and cracked it open. She closed the door and turned to him. She lowered her head, glaring. Have you been helping your dad? Jared shrugged. Care to explain? She said. He backed up a step. Your dumbass stepsister brought me up to speed, his mom said. Destiny wanted to tell me what a peach you are, helping the fucktard and his whore and her dumbass. So you redecorated my room, Jared said. She hurled her beer can at his head. He ducked. She shoved him, and when he didn't shove back, shoved him again. Fuck you, she said. You goddamn disloyal fucking piece of shit. I'm the one taking care of you, and you go and help that lying, whoring son of a bitch? Fuck you. He walked out and down the street. He expected her to follow him, expected to hear her truck, expected her to scream shit and throw things. But she didn't bother. Y'all, I feel like, in terms of writing, handling it that way is probably the most effective in getting across the horror of a situation like that. You don't need to write that his stomach sank. You don't need a description of his heart rate increasing or his sense of disappointment or any of that. All you need is exactly what happened. And you know that he's a human being and he's going to be reacting this way, whether the author specifically tells us that or not. And I find this a pretty important lesson in writing. I don't feel like you have to handle it this way. I don't feel like there's, there's one correct way to write a scene like this and have it be emotionally high impact. But I do think, for me, the matter-of-factness of the telling is part of what makes it so upsetting and makes it feel almost inevitable as you read it. Like, you should have known his mother was going to react this way. You should have known she'd find out that he was helping his dad. You should have known she was the one who destroyed his shit. You should have known, inevitably he was going to lose the one person that he thought he had on his side forever. I should have known. And I didn't see it coming at all. And it's just so, like, it jumps from the end of that chapter, she didn't even bother, to the beginning of the next chapter, Jared woke up on the floor in a motel. The room was a bunkhouse of guys sprawled in various states of passed out. Beer cans, vodka mickeys, and assorted empty booze bottles litter the place. So, this whole thing, he is just in a really bad place. It's been weeks, we find out. He'd parked at Blake's for a week and a bit, and then with Kelsey for a few nights before going back to Blake's. When he wore out his welcome, he asked Dylan if he could couch surf, but Dylan said his dad still held a grudge against Jared for mouthing off at him, and besides, Dylan was going to take a few days off school to go watch the all-native basketball tournament. After that, things got fuzzy. Jared recognized the name of the motel and realized it was the one he had been conceived in. He found his shoes and stuffed his feet in them. Dylan wasn't in the room. 
Dylan's truck was in the parking lot, and a stunned red-haired girl was sitting in it, buttoning her shirt. Dylan and Ebony were standing in front of it, and as Jared got closer, he could hear them arguing. Ebony was crying, her face leaking even as her expression remained stubbornly pleasant, waiting out Dylan's explanation about why she had just caught him with another girl. When he stopped, she bitch-slapped him with her purse. They both stood shocked, and then Ebony really laid in while Dylan shielded his face. So, it's been probably about two weeks at this point, maybe three, and he has just been crashing on people's couches. He's still going to school. I would like to register my admiration that this motherfucker has decided he is still going to fucking go to school with all of this going on. He finally gets in touch with his grandma later and asks if he can come stay with her for the summer. But he isn't even going to go over there now when his dropping out of school, I don't normally ever support that kind of like that decision, uh, something of that magnitude that has such far reaching consequences is dropping out. Like you can go back and get your GED, but it doesn't look good and it fucks up your resume and the impression that you give when you're trying to get jobs and stuff. But in Jared's case, I really felt like that should be what you do, guy. You bail. You can start school. You can do this year over again somewhere with a more stable life in front of you. And Jesus Christ, get the hell out of here. And it, it in some ways, it's, I admire it. And in some ways, I'm like, are you just hoping everything's going to somehow like go back to normal? Like, do you want it to go back to normal? Normal is really terrible. It's understandable why he's not willing to make that kind of huge jump. I am different in that respect. Like for me, when I was a junior in high school, I was applying to boarding schools, trying to get out of the school that I was in because it was not for me. The people were not for me. I just didn't feel like I was where I needed to be. And I had no problem with moving across the country by myself and that was fine. However, I am coming at that from a place of, I have a stable family at home that is sending me off with their blessing to somewhere temporarily, and then I can come back. Didn't work out that way in the end, but that's where I was coming from when I made that plan. And Jared, of course, is not coming at it from that angle. He is coming at it from the angle of, I am, I have basically been disowned if I move, I am cutting off ties with my mom forever. If I do this, she's never going to forgive me. She's never going to be able to get past it. And I have to know that I'm okay with that if I make this decision. And he hasn't quite gotten there yet. So it's obviously a very different situation for him. I tended to be a little bit more impulsive than Jared is when I was his age. So I probably would have done it anyway and dealt with the consequences later. But I would just like to register how differently, oops, sorry, dropped my watch there, how differently we all deal with things like this, because it really is a matter of privilege, of, of personality, and how much shit you've already had to put up with. You will be so much more willing to tolerate a lot more shit if you've already had to deal with like <laughs> the level of garbage, like if we're going on a scale of, of percentages, the level of garbage that Jared has had to deal with so far, I would put at about 80% um, coming from the perspective of, you know, somebody who is living in a uh, developed country and who has a, what's the word I want? And who is not living basically in like a war torn area. He is living with about 85% bullshit. So he is much more willing when it steps up another 10% to be like, well, I was already at 85 and granted 95 is a high number, but it's only 10% more garbage than what I had before. I get that. And it's just going to, you're just going to be so different in your reaction if you're 
you're him versus somebody like me who's like, oh, okay, I was dealing with 10% bullshit. And now you just dropped 80% more in my lap. I'm only at 95%, but it's such a jump. Or I'm only at 90% versus his 95, but it's such a jump for me that I completely like lose it and do something much more impulsive. Jared, oh, I really want this fucking kid to like, I don't know. I want him to go to his grandma's now and be saved. I want somebody to rescue him. That's what I want. Um, okay. So, um, he is going to try and get home. He is not interested in taking a ride with Dylan, who is in the middle of this fucking fight with Ebony. Like he knows that this is going to be big drama and he's not really interested. So he starts to head back home and this woman stops to give him a ride. I'm going to read this. This shit right here freaked me the fuck out. I don't know about y'all. An older burgundy caddy passed him and then pulled onto the shoulder. Jared jogged to catch up with it. He opened the door and stopped. An old native woman smiled at him, her giant glasses dusting her cheeks. Where are you heading? she said. Beneath her face, Jared could see something twisting. Crap he thought. I must have done acid last night. The old woman was plump and smiling, perfectly respectable in a flowered dress, work jacket, and square orthotic shoes. But Jared saw something in her that was dark as cedar bark, with large yellowed fangs and knobby twisted knuckles. Shrooms. He could have done magic mushrooms. That would do it too. Kitty Matt, he said, willing himself to get in the car. Oh, I'm not going that far, she said. I'm going to Terrace. Is that all right? That's perfect, Jared said, still not moving. The thing he was seeing drooled. The old lady raised an eyebrow. This is why we don't do shrooms or acid, he told himself. The psychedelics lingered and lingered, and he had to deal with shit like this, when in reality he had lucked out and gotten somebody to stop. He couldn't make himself lift his feet. I'm catching a chill, dear, she said. You shouldn't be picking up hitchhikers, Jared said. I have a good feeling about you, she said. You look familiar. Who's your mother? Maggie Moody. I don't know who that is. Where's she from? Bella Bella. Dad's a Martin from Alert Bay. Well, I'll be, she said. Do you know Sadie Cranmer? Sorry. I hate idling. It's bad for the environment. I think I forgot my phone back in the motel. Damn it. Thanks. Which motel? I can drive you back if you like. I wouldn't want to put you out. You look cold, dear. You shouldn't be out without a jacket in February. It, I would feel terrible if you caught your death. Jared shut the car door and backed up, smiling smiling and watching the thing underneath the grandma skin start to snarl. Get in the car, you moron, he told himself. Run, his inner voice told him. Run now. A logging truck rounded the distant curve toward coming toward them. The old woman shrugged and signaled, then drove off. The wake of the logging truck chilled him. He saw the car pause at the crest of a hill. A couple of trucks coming up from Rupert bombed past him. The caddy disappeared, and Jared headed back to the motel. The rain started to squall, gusting and driving sideways. Yo. Okay, listen. There are two tropes that are tired as hell, but when done right, are still super duper effective. One of them is the creepy child, and the other is the creepy old person. I have literal goosebumps right now. Not even kidding. That shit fucked me up. Robin. Girl. I don't know what it is about this that got me so bad, because I have objectively read other things that are, like, more overtly horror 
or scary or whatever. You know, I've been doing a bunch of Stephen King books while I, when I do this show. But this, again, I feel like it's the matter of factness. He sees this thing. This thing is what he thinks is really there. And then there's this other thing that he thinks is just a vision, but he's got a bad feeling. And the the way in which it is described, fangs, drooling, snarling, twisting. Oh, y'all, this is some shit that I feel like if I was watching this on a, on a TV show and this woman pulled over and he opens the door and she looks at him and she's this bright, happy old lady. And then you just see something under her skin, like smooth. I feel like I would hit the fucking ceiling. I think I would lose my shit. Like there are some things that I watch and don't scare me like blood and stuff. Like, I'm just like, ah, whatever I can watch a slasher movie. And I'm more afraid of like, the jump scare than I am of the actual violence. This is the kind of thing that gets under my skin. No pun intended, but pun totally intended and fucks with me for like a couple days. And the fact that this shit comes back later, I disapprove. Robin, what are you doing this to me for? I hate you. Um, Robbins just said, exactly. And we know we're reading a fantasy or magical realism book, but the fact that Jared doesn't know that's the story he's in just makes it creepier and makes us more worried for him. Exactly. And you know, not for nothing, I am a little irritated that Jared does not seem to be catching on to shit because he has crows talking to him later and he just doesn't pick up. And I'm like, you have had several animals talk to you. You had a guy get off a bus and apparently vanish, but a fucking raven flew away. Shit, dude, figure it out. Oh, and can I mention, I'm reading this and he gets that run, the inner voice told him, which I keep being like, I feel like that's part of this like magic is the, is maybe the person who fathered him, the Raven talking to him somehow. I don't know if that's true or what. I'm in the middle of reading this and I get the loudest ah! right behind my head. The headboard of my bed is up against a window and there was a crow right there outside my window that started cawing right then and just sat in my lawn for a few minutes before it left. Y'all, it was a little too immersive for me. I got a little bit freaked out. Not going to lie to you. Um, oh man. Between that and the fact that it's like really rainy and gloomy today as well, I just felt like I was just in this in a way that I haven't been since I started reading it. Um, so anyway, he gets a ride home in Dylan's truck. He drives because Dylan is fucked up. It turns out that uh, Ebony dumped his ass and Dylan is pretty... Okay, I'm about to sound really condescending here. Because what I want to say is Dylan is pretty convinced that he actually loves Ebony. And that makes it sound like he doesn't know what he's feeling and he's full of shit. And yada. I'm not even trying to say that. What I'm trying to say is Dylan is young. And Dylan is used to getting what he wants. And here's a woman who is not going to tolerate his shit. And I use woman very loosely. And he is not used to being held accountable for the shit that he does. I mean, we can see that pretty easily in his character. So I'm not exactly buying that he loves her. I am buying the fact that he is heartbroken, but whether or not that's due to love and not due to him kind of throwing a tantrum remains to be seen. But yeah, Dylan is just not in a good way. They head back to Jared's. And his place is just such a disaster. Dylan vomits all over the floor and then doesn't even clean it up and like leaves in the morning. Ah, I hate it. Um, I just, guys, I, again, everybody that is around Jared just seems like the worst. Um, so Jared, when he gets home, like he's sort of hoping that maybe his mom is going to be there. She isn't. Um, the place is his, like this, I, I would like to say, I figured that his mother was angry 
and basically did this to make life miserable and probably didn't want to see him, but would leave it as long as he was out of her way most of the time, basically. Like if he avoided seeing her and managed to just come in and out and sleep in there without actually like interacting with her, I figured that would be okay, that that was going to be how it would go. What his mother actually does is completely abandons him, doesn't pay the bills, doesn't let him know where she is, doesn't respond to any of his texts, and he interprets this as her giving him the finger and saying, you helped your dad pay his bills, I guess you can pay my bills. Eye for an eye kind of thing, which seems pretty in character for her, for how she is. And I just, it makes me so upset that she doesn't understand, even if that guy fucked your son and you over, that guy is still your son's father. And there is just a bond that is really hard to break when it is apparent that you had some good times with, like, you know, the way that his father left, he did not handle that shit well at all. I'm not defending the way that that all went down, but it's not like his father was, you know, super abusive from the time that he was a child and then he bailed and abandoned them. And for some reason, Jared's still sort of like attached to the guy. No, this was a guy that seemed to turn a corner sort of abruptly. And up until then, things between him and Jared were pretty solid and Jared loved him. And it's like for her, what his father did changes who that man is in her mind forever. And I know what that is like. I have had that with certain people where all of a sudden you're like, you, a switch has been flipped and that person is just not the one that you thought you knew. And there's no going back and you can't fix that and you can't change it. But that's not where Jared's at. He is somebody who had something good. And then that person turned a corner and fucked up. But in Jared's mind, I know he is still in there. And if I could help him get out of wherever he's gone to and come back out into the, the light again, he could be that person again that I used to know. I don't think at this point that that's actually true. Unfortunately, I, th I don't think that's never true. I think some people, you can sort of get them back, but they have to want to come back and they have to be like aware of, of who they are as well. At like this point, they have to have that sort of self-awareness and his father isn't there. His father isn't taking responsibility in any way for anything that's happening and is actively trying to rip Jared off. So I, uh, you know, it's, it's, I deeply understand where Jared's coming from and why he's doing what he's doing. It bums me out a lot that his mother can't see that and understand that. But in the end, I kind of think what, his, how his mother sees his father is probably more correct than how Jared sees his father. Jared's being a lot more compassionate and I respect that and admire that. And I don't even want to say it's the wrong way to handle it. I feel like he's really making an effort to do the right thing. But when it comes right down to it, I believe that when his mother says he's playing you, that's what he does, that she's right. I believe that she has gone through enough with this man to know and we know that his dad is playing him ourselves. I mean, Jared knows too, but he's acting like this is a special case, like a one-off that dad has never lied to me. And I can't believe this. And it's like, maybe dad has never lied to you, but she seems to know where if she speaks. So I would think he's done this shit before. And maybe this is just his maiden voyage and ripping you off specifically. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I feel really like I it's always hard for me when I watch people like react and act and 
not really take a moment to like actually communicate and talk it over, you know, and the way that she handled this is so terrible. Like there is really, I can't come up with a single excuse. Like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of, but it's so incredibly irresponsible and cruel. Cruel is really the thing. He says something about how it's like eye for an eye. And I'm sure she sees it that way, but it's absolutely not eye for an eye. And it's disgusting, frankly, that she decides to handle it this way and thinks that this is totally fair and what he deserves. Like, oh, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Um, So we get a weird chapter in the middle here, chapter 20, called The Human Manual. Um, I won't read the whole thing, but it's basically talking about the weirdness of how humans can be like almost identical in their DNA structure, except for a few things here and there, and then be so totally different. Um, I can say with great certainty that you and I, we were born from women. We look up at the night sky and see the same stars, the same moon, breathe and sleep and pray and work and daydream and sing and cry and fight and love. But in the end, our bodies are meat. They rot in the ground or burn in the fire or are pickled in their own casings, displayed like wax fruit for family and friends to weep over. Our bodies are transitory vessels built from recycled carbon like every other living being on this planet. Bits and parts of you have probably been a cricket or a dinosaur or a single blade of grass on the prairies. With all the power of technology and science in the world, I would bet you dollars to donuts that you still trust a human face to be a human. But come closer and let me speak to the creatures that swim in your ancient oceans, the old ones that sing to you in your dreams. Encoded memories so frayed, you think they're extinct, but they wait, coiled and unblinking, in your blood and your bones. If that isn't the raddest fucking paragraph in the whole fucking world. What? Guys, I can't wait for them to fucking uncoil. I'm freaked out by it. I got goosebumps again. Look at this. You can fucking see him too. But that is some shit and I loved it. Um, okay. Chapter 21. This is when Jared starts to get the final notices in the mail about how electricity is going to be shut off, yada, yada, yada. And this is when he finally gets in touch with his grandmother and is like, can I stay with you in the summer? To which his grandmother, like the glorious woman that she is, and I'm, let me hold on to her being glorious because I'm so worried that this book is going to continue into him living with her and she's going to turn out to be terrible. But let's just say that he isn't going to get screwed over by her for now. Just let me have this. Okay. So she immediately re- replies with, well, why wait? We can be in Canada in a week. Oh, I love her. She's ready to drop everything and just come back and, and fucking deal with this shit. She is not here to play. Bless you, Nana. Um, if his mom had hated him for helping his dad, she was going to disown him for running off to Nana's, but she was gone anyway. She wasn't answering her messages and she wasn't home. If he couldn't come up with the money to keep the house going, he'd ditch it. Fair. Not yours. Like, they own the house outright. So it's not like the house is just going to be taken away. It's just going to be shut down, you know? So meanwhile, the tenants are all leaving. Um, and Joseph, this guy, one of the tenants, he says, tell your mom she owes me. I'm taking the bandsaw, but she still owes me 1400 and she's not getting any more coke till I get paid. Ugh. All like every little bit that we learn about everybody always like winds up being worse than it was before. Um, normally this was the time of year when he and the Jackses turned the soil in the garden and got it ready for the potatoes. All bets were off this year. Everything felt shaky and planning felt dangerous. So Jared goes to school to shower. He's like getting food from the, uh, the, what do you call it? Donations food bank. That's the one. Um, it's just, he's really barely making it here. You know, 
I really thought that he was going to turn around and try and ask his dad if he could use his place to bake um, and make some money that way. Because essentially his loyalty to his dad is what got him ruined. But he also doesn't want to set eyes on his dad again after his dad fucked with him. So I just feel like put down some rules that you're not getting involved with him, that you using his kitchen is him paying you back for money that you were ripped off from. And then you can get a little bit back on your feet or at least get enough to like fucking pay the electricity until you find out where you want to go. Um, but it doesn't seem like dealing with his dad is even on the table for him anymore. Like, so, and I respect that. I mean, we all draw the lines in different places and I'm somebody who I couldn't just leave it that somebody basically stole from me and stole money that I really could not afford to just give away. And I was giving away freely anyway. And then it turns out that they were literally lying to get it. I couldn't let that go. And I'd want them to make restitution somehow. So using the kitchen to cook would be how I felt better about the situation. But Jared seems like he just wants to wash his hands of the whole thing and just like, forget it. And I get that, you know, I, just different way of dealing with things. Um, so this is when he sees Sarah and she says, um, Hadi, which is hello, um, in her native language. She says, that's as far as I've gotten decolonizing my language. Um, but I don't know how to pronounce that. So forgive me. It's H A D I H. Um, and she asks if she can come and stay with him. And he's like, yeah, I mean, why would you want to? But yeah, you can. And she says that Gran's in a mood um, and tells him we had grandpa for a week and he almost killed himself in the garage. He's back in respite and Gran is wrecked. Now, I wanted some more detail on this because he almost killed himself can mean a lot of things. It can mean he was fucking around with shit that he isn't a, like, he doesn't want to accept. He's not capable of fucking around with anymore. And he almost had a fatal accident or it could be, he tried to commit suicide and she sent him away again because he was about to do this. It sounds the way that she says, Gran is wrecked. Like the second one, I assumed the first one when she said it, but then when she followed it up with Gran is wrecked, I was like, Oh shit. Does she mean this? And I don't know. I I, uh, I feel really bad for Mrs. Ms. Jax either way. But um, they wind up skipping school. And he thinks to himself about how she has the puffy-eyed look of someone who'd been crying and had covered it up with makeup that caked. And I am really curious about like more of what's going on in her life because we don't really hear her talking about her parents or anything. And they go to his place and they are trying to hook up and there's this weirdness to it. Like they haven't had sex already. I assumed when they woke up in bed together a couple chapters ago, that meant that they had had sex while they were drunk and maybe they had. And this hooking up just feels really weird because they're both like mostly sober and aware of it when they weren't before. Or it could be that they just passed out drunk in the same bed together and they totally did not hook up. And this is the first time. Um, but there is a lot of, of revelation in this relationship between the two of them. So first of all, she wants him to spank her. She wants to be tied up or wants to tie him up. Jared is not interested. Um, and she's like a little pushy about it. And I have a lot of like feelings about this where I'm like, on the one hand, I really understand when you have a certain kind of fetish and it comes from a place that's like emotional, really wanting a person that you care about to get into it with you and be able to fulfill that with you. On the other hand, I'm not a huge fan of how pushy she gets with him when he isn't really into this and not comfortable with it. And he's like a young kid and 
he makes it very clear more than once that this is not something that he is into. And she does not seem to respect that. And that bothered me a little bit. On the other hand, it's obvious she's dealing with some pretty big issues because he finds all of these cuts on the inner thighs and on her inner thighs and asks her what they're from and says, who did that? And she says, I did. Um, and this motivates him to tell her about David. And because like, I think he thinks that maybe somebody has been hurting her for the fun of it. And she doesn't really want to tell him about it. So he says, my mom dated this douche named David. He didn't like my grades. So he broke a couple of my ribs slowly. He got a boner when I started screaming. There goes a detail that we didn't know. Don't care for that one. Dislike, thumbs down, do not recommend. Um, and so finally she tells him, I feel numb all the time. Like I took sleeping pills and can't wake up. I just want to feel something. I don't want to hurt you, Jared said, and I don't want to be hurt. What happened to him? Mom nail gunned his feet to the floor. She laughed. She turned her head and kissed his cheek. She put the J in his mouth. I like your mom. Have you ever stood under northern lights? She said. Yeah. I like how they crackle. That's how you sound right now. Cool. I'm serious, she said. You're wasted. I'm wasted. We are wasted. You hum real loud, like an electric guitar being tuned or power lines on a hot day. I hear you all the time. I know where you are. Jared giggled, and then Sarah giggled, and they bumped their heads together. Whoa, Sarah said. You're glowing. Yeah? I can see your bones. Look at your bones. You're an x-ray. Jared looked down at himself, but didn't like, but didn't see what she saw. Sarah made sounds like a lightsaber. What? Okay. It's one thing if he could also see it and just didn't notice. But she's seeing something that he can't see at all. And I have a million questions about that. Is it because she's high? Does the high allow her to see things on another plane? Like, a lot of people use drugs to sort of access what they think is a level of consciousness that they believe is simply a drop out of their reach. Um, and if they're just smoking weed, I mean, you know, similar to something like peyote, a lot of people believe that any visions that they have when they use something like that are real. It's not that the drug made them see something that wasn't there. It's that the drug allowed them to see something that is always there that they just can't see most of the time. Is that what's going on here? Or is it just a high? Or if he can't see it, but she can, does that mean she's got something going on magically that he doesn't have that allows her to see him differently? What the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? Um, Sarah straddled him, lifting her arm and showing him her new cuts, presenting them like Vanna. He wasn't sure how he was supposed to react, so he played it cool, nodding. She hadn't had them last night. She must have done them while he was asleep. She used an exacto knife on herself in front of him. She met his eye, as if daring him to say something. As long as she didn't cut him, he was fine with it. Well, maybe not fine. Maybe weirded out. She got lost in the cutting, and he became a piece of furniture, something she sat on. That sucks. Just flat out, I hate that. I am a firm believer in do what you want with your own body. If she wants to cut herself, I'm not even going to, like, try and have any sort of high ground on that. Like, I don't think there is a high ground to be had. If that makes you feel something and you need that, and that will get it for you, and you're not hurting anybody but yourself, well, okay, I guess that's a way to cope, you know? Like, fucking, what do I know? 
But the fact that it turns into a thing where he seems to disappear for her, that's rough. That, I just, I hate it, you know? Um, because it's sort of, I have been sort of hanging all of my hopes on Sarah a little bit in terms of him having something with her that's real and for her to be able to like tune him out in this fashion and sort of use him. And I I hesitate to use that word because it feels kind of harsh, but it is a little true. It just makes me sad. I don't want this for them, you know? Um, so they have this uh, whole little like playtime where she uses a headband to really lightly restrain him, which he's not super into, but she manages to sort of like bribe him into trying it because she tells him that she can unzip a fly with her teeth, which immediately makes him get a boner, like a, very abruptly. Um, and she leaned in to kiss him and he turned his head. She puckered and made kissy noises because she just gave him a blowjob for a second and he doesn't want to kiss her right after, which I just find to be such bullshit when guys won't kiss you after you've given them a blowjob. You know what, dude? Get the fuck over yourself. Um, and it's sort of like weird because on her way down to giving him the blowjob, she pauses on his ribs and stuff and he's really like not into that at all. And I found it really interesting that the, this writer was cool with writing awkward moments like this into this sex scene, because that's something I feel like most writers either make a sex scene real, real awkward from beginning to end in order to emphasize that these two people are really not supposed to be together or that they're both super uncomfortable or whatever, or they make it like this perfect balance, this dance, both seem to know what the other wants, yada, 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 everything's amazing. And this is a really, like, she does some things really right and some things not well for him at all. And you don't see that that often. A sex scene that's just kind of, like, hot and cold. Some things work, some things don't. And that's a lot closer to real life. But it's just interesting, you know, to realize as I'm reading it how infrequently this sort of happens. Um, so this is when she talks about her parents. Um the great uncles are threatening to drive down. She said, mom never talks about them. We're supposed to tell people we're Spanish. He says, wow. And she says, I know, right? She says, I'm mostly white. My dad's white. She's half white. Gran lost her status when she married a white guy. He never liked me even before we went senile. Even before he went senile, he sees a brown cunt like everyone else. Jared wasn't sure what to say. Dad works all the time. Mom works a lot. She said she wasn't meant to be a mom. We're all supposed to pretend that we're okay, that we don't secretly hate ourselves. Um, and she assures him after a little bit that her, his mother is going to come back. And he realizes, like, he doesn't know if he actually even wants that or not. Which is, you know, once you get to a point like this, it does sort of start to look like, I've figured out how to get by, I guess. So maybe I just would rather not cope with this and move on with my life. Um, But I love this moment. Sarah came back in a flowered dress. She would brought a can of vanilla frosting and some Sesame Street cake decorations. She told him to close his eyes. He could hear her getting undressed and getting on the mattress. She giggled. Ready, she said. She was naked on the cushions with her legs open. Her crotch was frosted and she'd placed a cookie monster decoration over her clit. Jared collapsed in helpless laughter while she sang C is for cookie. I think I love you, Jared said. She made a face. You'd say anything to get laid. That's a scene. Um... So a little bit later, I'm going to have to speed this up because I've only got five minutes left. Um, we have a tenant who's feeling kind of bad for Jared because he seems to have gone through something sort of similar to what Jared is going through and gets it a little bit. And he comes by with pot roast. Um, and Jared's like, I don't know what the fuck to do with this. What is this? 
like not super grateful, <laughs> but I understand. And it's not like there are cookbooks in the house. He doesn't even have internet to look it up. Um, so Jared, um, he asks if she will come over and bring the cookbook and she's gonna head over and he hears a knock and thinks it's her, but it's Dylan. And Dylan wants him to come out and Jared, they basically get into a big fight. Dylan expects Jared to just jump and come with him wherever they're going to go. But he also doesn't want to like really be friends or be supportive of him. Like, it's just, there are a lot of friendships out there like this where it's sort of weird and, and you're not really friend friends, but you just keep each other company when you need it. And um, yeah, the whole thing is uh, really sort of, I liked that Jared is calling out Dylan for being spoiled and expecting everything to go his way. Um, but there, there is part of me that feels like he's only on the surface of what really needs to be said here. And that he should just be like, I don't want to be your friend, dude, because that seems when you get down to it, what really is going on here. But Jared also has nobody. So I can also understand not wanting to cut somebody off completely, you know? Um, so this is when she talks about like how heteronormative he is and he doesn't understand these, like this terminology or anything. So he's asking if she was, she says, so you like chicks or guys or both? Is that like the trans one or the bi? And she stops and looks at him and then just gets down and says, you are so not getting laid tonight. And I felt bad in one way, but I also was like, I can really understand her not feeling like she wants to explain this shit because it gets really tiring to do this over and over again. Um, the house was quiet after she left. He felt his life stretching in front of him like a highway at night. If he just left, if he left the house, no one would miss him. Well, that's enough moping, he told himself. Time to roast some cow. So he wakes up in the middle of the night and his mom is just standing there at the foot of his bed, staring at him, swaying high as fuck. And he says he's sorry. And she says, liar. And he says, I'm not lying. And she says, you aren't sorry, but you will be. And I don't care for this at all. He gets up and he goes and stays with crash pad for a while. Um, I was very worried as I read through this that there might be a Doctor Who spoiler, but so far, so good. Just warn me, Robin, if there's any Doctor Who spoilers that you know of. Um, and he is really trying to make himself as useful as he can while staying with George. And at one point, Dylan comes by and tries to talk to him. And George already doesn't trust him, and or George's mom already doesn't trust him and lets him know, like, I counted the money in his piggy bank thinking that he's going to steal. And uh, when Dylan comes to talk to him, it seems to her for the, like, first couple minutes that this is confirmation this kid is no good because he's friends with somebody who bullies her son. And when she says something to him later, he picks on George Jared replies, I won't let him. But then when she like considers him for a second, she believes him and she lets him back in and he like helps butcher some fish and all this stuff. And this is when these crows show up. That's a lot of fish. Someone said, Jared looked around trying to find the person who was talking. You can't eat all of that by yourselves. Slowly, Jared raised his head and the crows were watching him. Have a heart, one of them said. We're hungry. Jared's breath came fast. We'd be happy with the guts, another of them said to him. You don't even have to give us the bellies. Jared stood, stunned frozen. Typical raven, one of the crows said to his pals. Greedy and selfish. Human lover, another spat. They shot into the air as one, an angry black cloud of wings and beaks and talons, dive-bombing his head before they sped off into the trees. Some of the fish were missing from the barbecue rack. Ah, uh, hi, I loved that. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I love it. The fucking crows are really unimpressed with ravens and think the ravens are snobs. And you know what? I bet they would be. I bet ravens would be huge fucking snobs. Oh, I love it so much. Um... So he goes to school. 
yada, 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 comes home. His mom is like trying to cook for him and shit. And he's like, are you just going to try and pretend that you didn't do- totally abandon me for like almost a month? Are you, are we really just going to p- pretend? And she says, and she just stares at him and he says, okay, I guess we're just going to be in denial. Okay, fine. Um, when she, when he, she asks why you pawn the TV, he's like, we had fucking bills to pay. I don't know what to tell you. And she gets as close as she ever does to an apology saying, I was pissed. You have no idea what it took not to strangle you. Yeah, Jared said, that's love. She side eyed him. That's the only thing that kept you from being mulch. Um, so, you know, all of this, yada, yada, yada. Sarah comes over. I don't understand this. The the whole thing turns into a party. People start getting drunk and he's not having a good time. They're taking selfies and stuff. And he finally decides to bail. And when he gets downstairs, his mother has sent him a picture of himself. And it says, kill and die. She captioned it. What the fuck does that mean? And then we have the final chapter in this section. Um, oh, thank you. Robin says, because earlier she'd said she'd kill and die for him. Oh, got you. So that was her basically being like, I know I bailed, but I still love you. Again, about as close to an apology as you're going to get from her, I guess. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Cause I really did not know how to take that. Cool. That makes me feel a little bit better. Um, so then he has this weird dream about these killer whales and the old lady that he almost took a ride from. Um, it's super weird. They're on a boat. There are all these orcas hanging around and he asks, what's with your face? Uh, you got some monster showing through. It's not a monster. She said, it's magic. I don't let it out. And it gets frustrated. Your monster gets frustrated. Yes. I'm in Prince George right now visiting some family, but I'd like to drive back so we can talk. How does that sound? Can't we talk now? It's a little rude to be inside your head. I barely know you. I'm assuming you're one of us, but you don't know it yet. One of who? Do you want to talk to me? Do you want answers? Jared shrugged. As long as your monster stays away from me, I don't ever let my magic loose, she said. The seal barked on the rocks, humping themselves higher up on the shore as the orcas continued circling, studying them. I need to visit a few people, my dear boy, and then I'll see you in a day or so. Okay, Jared said, wanting to get this part of the dream over with. She smiled, but the monster underneath her face snarled at him. I'll see you soon, Jared. Later, Jared said. So she knows his name. Dislike that. She said something about how she doesn't want him to catch his death earlier, but now she's coming to see him. Don't care for that either. He expected the dream to change, to shift or end, but it didn't. He got up and leaned on the railing, watching the orcas. He saw his own reflection in the water, shivering in the waves, and the orcas, luminous patches of white and shadowed black, swimming beneath the surface. He could taste the sea salt and smell the funky dead fish air from the orcas' blowholes when they surfaced to spout. This is so creepy, Jared said. Do you mind? One of the orcas said. We're hunting here. I don't know if I'm going crazy or not. It's not all about you, the orca said. I have mouths to feed, you know. Yeah, another one said. We don't come and mess up your hunt. Wake up, a third one said. Love this. No idea what's going on. Is it astral projection or what? But I don't care, and I love it. (laughs) And the end of that chapter is him trying to tell Sarah about his dream and her just being like, I'm not interested in hearing about how you fucked some movie star or whatever. Um, And... When she when he asks about whether Idol No More, the protest, he's like, oh, I thought that was over. Sarah and George gave him cool, lethal stares. I am this close to perpetrating some lateral violence on your ass, she said. 
Dude, George said. That's cold. What? Jared said. What? So I assume they're reacting this way because Jared is unaware that this is an ongoing thing. That he's like that disengaged from it all. Which, like, I can forgive him because he's got some shit going on, guys. But okay, sure. Um, but man, there is a lot happening in this story, guys. Thank you, Robin, for introducing me to this. This is Robin. Is this part of a series or is this just the one book? Um, I really need to go. I'm over time, but I am really enjoying this. I have no idea what's going to happen. Like, I really don't have any predictions to make here. Um, ooh, Robin says it's, it's a trilogy. I didn't know that. That's fun. Okay, cool. Um, we are two, the two are out so far. Okay, cool. So she's writing the third one now. Neat. That's fun. Um, all right, cool. Well, thank you, Robin, very much for commissioning this. I hope that you guys are enjoying my coverage of it. And, um, that's about everything, I think. So I will see you all soon with a new episode. Spoiled Network Podcast.